As the event title indicates, the lecture is made possible by the generosity of Mark and Becky Lanier and their library. The Lanier's and Charles Mickey, director of the library, are unable to be with us this year. Nevertheless, please join me in expressing our appreciation for their commitment to Lubbock, to Lubbock Christian University, and to theological conversation. It's wonderful to see how many people are interested in things like this. My name is Jeff Carey. I serve as the interim dean of the Alfred and Patricia Smith College of Biblical Studies, and I want to welcome Al and Pat Smith, especially here tonight, who are with us. And thank you all for coming and helping make the Lanier Lecture a significant academic event. As you came in, you were handed a program and a card. The card is for writing down questions that we will use at the time of Q&A. And uh, those will be taken up at the time the question and answer session begins. Our provost of LCU, Dr. Foy Mills, will now extend further words of welcome. Thank you, and as a consummate teacher, y'all need to take those white cards and ask questions. That's what every teacher does. You want your students to ask questions, so please take that opportunity to do that. I want to welcome you to Lubbock Christian University. Thank you for joining us this evening for this auspicious occasion. I also want to thank the Lanier Theological Library, and specifically Mark, for his and Becky's investment in this event that is now in its eighth year. I also want to thank AIM Bank for their generous support of this event. Would you please uh, join me in recognizing these two people? <laughs> we anticipate an exceptional evening. And I, I want you to know that here at Lubbock Christian University, we want to be engaged in those great theological conversations. And so it is my pleasure at this time to welcome Dr. Jesse Long, who will introduce our guest speaker for the evening. Dr. Long. James K. Hoffmeyer is Professor Emeritus of Near Eastern Archaeology and Old Testament at Trinity International University Divinity School, Deerfield, Illinois where he taught since 1999. Born and raised in Egypt, the son of missionaries, Hoffmeyer graduated from Wheaton College with a BA in Near Eastern Studies and Archaeology. At the University of Toronto, he received his MA in Egyptian Archaeology in 1975. He participated in excavations in Egypt in 1975 and 1977 with the Akhenaten Temple Project, directed by Professor Donald Redford, probably the premier Egyptologist of his generation. He completed his PhD from the University of Toronto in 1982, concentrating on Egyptian religion. From 1980 to 1999, he was on the faculty of Wheaton College, where he chaired the Department of Biblical and Archaeological Studies for five years. Hoffmeyer directed the North Sinai Archaeological Project that was designed to study Egypt's eastern frontier during the New Kingdom. This is around 1550 to 1200 BC which included excavating at Tel El Borg from 1999 to 2008. Professor Hoffmeyer has authored numerous articles and books, including, to name just a few of his books, Israel in Egypt, Evidence for the Authenticity of the Exodus Tradition, Ancient Israel in Sinai, Evidence for the Authenticity of the Wilderness, Tradition and his lecture tonight actually comes out of, uh, of this volume. The Archaeology of the Bible, it's now been translated into German, Italian, Spanish, Dutch, Romanian, Norwegian, and Arabic, 
when people often ask me what's a good book on biblical archaeology, this is the book I recommend, although right now it's out of print. But if you can find a copy, you need to, to purchase it. Do historical matters matter to faith? Akhenaten, his religion, and the origins of monotheism. Genesis, history, fiction, or neither. Three views on the Bible's earliest chapters. And then also a couple of volumes on his excavations at Tel El Borg. Hoffmeyer has also appeared in and consulted for TV programs on Egypt and the Bible for the Discovery Channel, the Learning Channel, the History Channel, and National Geographic. Jim and his wife, Kathy, and Kathy is, uh, is with us this evening. Jim and his wife, Kathy, have two children. Jessica has degrees in Near Eastern Studies and Archaeology and has done PhD work in Egyptology. She and her husband, Paul, have four sons. Jim and Kathy's son, Benjamin, holds the MA degree in theological studies, has coached football at the high school and college level, and is now head football coach and Bible teacher at Brazos Christian School in Bryan, Texas, where he lives with his wife of one year, Farron. Dr. Hoffmeyer has served as an elder in several churches over most of the past 40 years. He often uh, speaks at conferences. In fact, he just arrived last night from a conference at Bar Ilan University in Tel Aviv, without his luggage, by the way. But he was the, he was the featured uh, speaker or one of the featured presenters at the conference. And I'd like for you to, to look. We, um, we were shopping last night at Penny's just before it closed, and we think that, that we dressed him up uh, really nicely. He, he's going to look good tonight. <laughs> but he also, and this is one of the things that I especially appreci appreciate, he preaches and teaches in churches in America and around the world. We've asked Dr. Hoffmeyer to address the question, where is Mount Sinai? You may ask, does that matter? To which he will reply, no, it doesn't. But the theological significance of, of this question is uh, really something that underlies our conversation, our discussion tonight. Would you join me in welcoming to the podium Welcoming Dr. James K. Hoffmeyer. Thank you. Well, thank you. Is there no uh, Thursday night NFL game tonight? Well, it's a good thing the Bears aren't. Are the Bears playing? Okay. Well, if I would have known, I wouldn't. Oh, I'm glad to be here. Anyway, last time I was here was Monday Night Football, and there was still a great crowd, so I appreciate your interest in, in academic matters. I'd like to add my thanks to those of the previous uh, uh, colleagues up here, thanking the Lanier uh, Library, Mark and Becky Lanier. Um, last time I was here, Mark Lanier was here for the lecture and introduced me, and uh, during our time off, uh, before lectures began, we went to a clothes store that he, where he buys some of his clothes, and we bought it. He got me a tie. It's my, I call it my Lubbock tie. And I would have worn it tonight, but it's not here. So Jesse loaned me one of his ties, for which I'm very grateful. And so as you can see, I'm clothed, but the only question is, am I in my right mind uh, for tonight? So that will be determined in the coming uh, three hours of our lecture tonight. Okay. Where is Mount Sinai and why it doesn't matter? That's not just a provocative title to get you here. Uh, it really is hopefully a, a serious question. Now, this map shows you a number of proposed Mount Sinai locations. At one point I had documented somewhere between 14 and 15 proposed Mount Sinai locations. And uh, not all of them are on this map, but some of them are off the map to the north, and some are off to the map to the south. And when people are that far off, 
uh, you have to say, what are they thinking? Um, so I, I give you some of the ones, and the ones that you see on the map here tonight, I will be exploring those as, as possibilities. Now, the question we have to ask, and my approach to this question on the geographical question of where is Mount Sinai, what I'm trying to do is chart a course based on th what we know. We know a couple datum points. And the first thing you have to get right is where you start from. And that we know, thanks to the Bible, and we also know where they end up. The question is all the stuff in the middle. But what I'd like to do as much as possible tonight is not work from the assumptions that some have who want to find a particular amount they think meets the description and then try to work backwards and get back to Egypt. And so my approach is let's start where we know things started and follow, again, those of you who are a little bit older like me, from the old days of travel before Siri came along, was you go to AAA and you said, I'm going from point A to point B, and they give you what they call a trip tick. Do you remember the trip ticks? You know, all these pieces of paper, and you turn left to here and you turn right. Well, basically, you can do that all electronically now. There's a wonderful ad some years ago on Israeli TV. I've seen it, it's in Hebrew. And you have this picture of Moses and all these people following him in the wilderness, and he's looking very perfuddled, not knowing which way to go. And all of a sudden, there's this flash in the sky, and this lightning bolt comes down, and something lands in his hand, and it's a GPS. <laughs> and if only, but we don't have that. What we do have is uh, a number of descriptions, and Numbers 33 is one of the important ones, because it's an entire triptych, if you will, of the, the journey from Egypt to the arrival of the Hebrews in the land of Moab opposite uh, Jericho. And this is how chapter 33 begins. These are the stages of the people of Israel when they went out of the land of Egypt by their companies under the leadership of Moses and Aaron. Moses wrote down their starting places stage by stage by command of the Lord, and these are the stages according to their starting places. They set out from Ramesses in the first month, the 15th day of the first month. So we can follow that trail, and we'll see in a moment, we know where that begins. It starts at Ramesses and ends in the plains of Moab. We have a more detailed geographical description in Exodus 15, 22 through 19, verse one, and that's when they arrive at Mount Sinai. We have another very important datum point, and this is in the uh, book of Deuteronomy, chapter 1 and verse 2, where we are told it's an 11-day journey from Mount Horeb to Kadesh Barnea, and we think we know where that is, by way of Mount Seir. And Mount Seir is another way of referring to the land of Edom, the very southern part of, of Jordan, Dr. Jesse Long's uh, favorite country. Jordan. And so we have, this is perhaps the most important uh, geographical pointer because it's telling us how much travel was involved going from Mount Sinai to Kadesh Barnea. And it's, as I said, its location is fairly well established. So working with the biblical data, I think what we can do is say some of the proposed candidates for Mount Sinai fit within the biblical data and others can be summarily dismissed. And so what I'd like to do is try to, at the end of the night, say, well, these are possibilities, these are not. And then you can still go home and get a good sleep. Okay. Now, if you follow the itinerary in Numbers 33 that we just talked about, one thing becomes very clear. And just in reading this, let's pretend we don't know where any of these places are because 90% of them we don't. I'm going to show you why I believe where the starting point is, is clear and that's what the whole major part of what we talked about uh, in 2012 was. So if you did not make it to that lecture 
or like most of you, forgotten. By the way, I, I reviewed it to make sure I don't tell the same jokes over again, in case any of you remember them. Go back, take a look at that. Amazingly, there have been 66,000 views of that video from that night here uh, in 2012. So thank God for that. Hopefully it's been helpful to people. But we have the starting point, and then the Bible makes it clear that three camp spots later, or the equivalent of three days travel later, they are at the sea through which God will lead them through. Three days travel. From that point on, from crossing the, the sea, and here's where it gets a little complicated because both Exodus 15 and Numbers 33 report that they had a three-day journey into the desert and it's not clear whether those three days are equivalent to the first three places mentioned, Mara, Elim, and Yam Suf. And then it goes on. But you see, there are either eight or 11 places where they camped, days journey apart, till they got to Mount Sinai. So you do the math. Where they crossed the, 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 the sea, should be relatively close to Egypt, whereas the mountain should be some further distance away from the sea to Mount Sinai. Now, locating Ramses, uh, again, that is something we could spend more time on, but we just don't have the time tonight, so hopefully you'll trust me that there is universal agreement after about a century of trying to locate the uh, the site of Ramesses. And the reason we can do this is because the Pharaoh Ramses II, uh, you remember him perhaps as Yul Brynner in the movies, <laughs> he, he dates from 1279 to 1213 BC, and he built a new capital named after himself. It's called P. Ramesses, or the House of Ramses. And from about 1270 on, that city flourished for about 150 years, and then it was abandoned. And what complicated things was the ever-recycling Egyptians took all the blocks, the major blocks, from that city, statues, obelisks, large stone blocks with inscriptions, and moved them 12 miles to the north, used it to establish a new capital called Tanis. And you all know Tanis, that's where Indiana Jones was. Okay? If you go to Tanis today, you'll see blocks all over the place that were removed there from the city of Ramses. So that's why it was so hard to find Ramses, because most of the superstructure was removed. And only subsequently has it been found 12 miles to the south of Tanis. And uh, there is general recognition that Ramses mentioned five times, and you see the Bible references there under the second bullet point, those five references all occur in the Pentateuch, in the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, and the Book of Numbers. And that site is known in Arabic today as Kantir. And so Egyptologists universally agree that is ancient Ramses. Many scholars believe that it corresponds to the biblical Ramesses. So here you can see Tanis in the north and to the south and west a little bit, Kantir or P. Ramesses. Uh, here is to give you a little indication of what Cantier looks like today, except my daughter's not in the picture most of the time. These only some broken fragments of statues and things that broke in transportation got left behind, like these massive footprints, uh, footsteps, and part of this statue of Ramses the Great. Archaeologists have found a number of blocks, and so there's very little doubt that these are from Pyramuses. Here is uh, my friend and colleague, Dr. Edgar Pusch from Hildesheim, Germany who for 25 years directed research and excavations. There are those feet, and he's got his foot on them there. His colleagues are working on magnetometer subsurface surveys, which enables us to actually map out the ancient city. Uh, I had the good fortune this past uh, August, August, the, uh, not this August as in two months ago, but a year ago, of uh, he and I were on a lecture tour together, and here we are in Adelaide, Australia, believe it or not and we were traveling Adelaide and Melbourne, and we had lots of time to talk about Ramses and his work and the wonderful lectures he gave, and we 
complemented each other very nicely with our respective lectures. But here you can get a sense for what this ancient city was like. Here's the modern town of Kantir built over this ancient city and around it the magnetometer survey has, has identified all kinds of buildings. We'll take a closer look. Look at that. Isn't that amazing? Um, the kind of things that, that this uh, can uh, expose. This is, these structures are all mud brick. So distinguishing mud brick from the mud matrix it's in is really difficult, uh, very tricky excavation-wise. But you can see what we have here is a temple. We can see the wall that surrounds the temple. Uh, this is probably where the great entryway pylon was, open court. And as you move back to the Holy of Holies, way back in here. Here are storage facilities. Uh, these are mud brick storage facilities. And remember, the Israelites are making bricks for the store city of Ramses. Uh, I would like to speculate and this sort of leave you dangling out there. Could these storage facilities of this temple be some of the bricks the Israelites made? We'll never know, but that's the sort of thing that would have been happening, Ramses making this huge city. There you see the storehouses. Another thing that was found by Edgar Push in his excavations were the uh, royal stables. And you can see the plan on the left, excavations on the right. And these are the hitching, they were in horse country, so you all know what I'm talking about here. These are hitching posts in the stables where the horses could be tied up when they're being groomed or whatever they were working on. Here's a restoration of the uh, stables. And uh, he calculated based on the number of stalls that there could have been 360 horses kept in his royal stables. So the idea of Pharaoh dispatching his chariots uh, in pursuit of the Hebrews, uh, certainly um, it would have happened from here, and I believe a number of other places as well. Okay, so we know where Ramses is. We're learning more and more about it. Edgar has retired, and he's passed on his work at the site to a young, uh, another German scholar named Hofmeier. Not Hofmeier, but we're friends too, so that's nice. Okay. We're trying to figure out where Mount Sinai is. We also have to figure out where the sea is. The red circles represent some of the proposed Red Sea crossing locations. And I'm talking about proposals in, of recent scholarship, or in some cases, the people proposing them, in my view, are not scholars. But anyway, we read books by them. We see videos by them. And so you can see that uh, by, by my count here, there are about nine different sea possible crossings. So, you know, again, which is the sea crossing? Um, now, another important question we have to answer is what is a day's journey? The Bible describes travel by a day's journey. In fact, even in the New Testament, they'll talk about a Sabbath day's journey. There's only a certain distance you could travel. So things were not necessarily measured in miles or kilometers, but uh, travel was typically done on foot. As this scene illustrates, here is a, it's a, just a sketching. This is from a drawing at Sirabit al Qadim in Sinai. We'll be there a little bit later tonight. But at Sirabit, here is this man who's identified in the hieroglyphs as the brother of the prince or ruler of Rechinu, which is Syria. And we have his name. Now, why it's written in hieroglyphs is because the brother lived in Egypt. And he probably was involved in turquoise mining operations at Sirabit al Qadim, which is a site we'll go later, but that's where the Egyptians mined for turquoise and they also mined for copper. Now, you can see here's this very uppity up son of the prince son of the ruler, and he's sitting on a donkey, and his, his attendants are walking. Travel, as this famous scene that uh, some of you know, uh, of the uh, West Semitic peoples coming into Egypt around 1800 BC, thereabouts, once again, we see these people are traveling. Donkeys are used as pack animals, or for little children, I'm reminded, in Exodus 4, when Moses and Zipporah head back from the land of Midian to Egypt, it refers to the children being on a donkey. So this is for young kids. I mean, once you're old enough to be cool, like a, probably a 10-year-old, you walk and you have a spear and you think you're a big shot. But everybody else you see is walking. The animals are used for your supplies, your food, and maybe the littlest kids. The point is, 
when you talk about travel, it's not how far you can go on a donkey or how far you can go on a horse or a camel. It's walking speed. So a day's journey is based on walking speed. And backing up just a second, a day's journey is typically understood as how far you could walk from probably shortly after sunrise to just before sunset. So 12 hours a day, let's say. And if you work on a very light formula of, let's say, about two miles per hour, you know, I think about these things when I'm on, on my treadmill working out. I know I need more workout on the treadmill. But anyway, I look, I say, okay, this is two miles an hour. Boy, it's really slow. But, you know, if you've got sheep and goats and other things with you, you don't walk like you're trying to catch a plane at DFW. Uh, but this would mean at, a, at that pace, and again, depending on terrain, uh, 24 miles a day could probably be the max you're covering. Now, interestingly, studies based on ancient texts that talk about caravans traveling from point A to point B, and we can figure out on a map how far they are apart, as well as 19th century ethnographic studies that studying uh, caravans in, in, well, relatively modern times, uh, the distances traveled them are anywhere between 15 and 23 miles. So again, the variable is going to be the, the conditions of travel. So you can see about how much one could travel in a day. So let's work with the average of about 20 miles a day is a, is a day's journey. So we're told that the people of Israel journeyed from Ramesses to Sukkoth, and that is repeated both, I mean, that's stated in Exodus uh, 12, 37, as well as Numbers 33, 3. And it's repeated in Numbers 33, 5. So we have three different uh, references all agreeing that they traveled from Ramesses and encamped. And the word uh, for camp there uh, is, is related to the idea of tenting, because that's, that's what they're doing. Now, I'm just going to go over the Bible verses, and then we'll go back and try to look at the geography. They moved on from Sukkot and encamped at Etam, and this is critical, on the edge of the wilderness. They are about to leave Egypt. They're just about in Sinai. And then God says, tell the Israelites to turn back. Hebrew word is shuv. And camp in front of Piha, he wrote, between Migdal and the sea in front of Baal You shall come uh, opposite it by the sea. So we have a cluster of place names. And now it's not clear how close these are to each other. But they all seem to be somehow connected to the region or the general area where this sea is. Now, go back to that list we looked at. And, and once again, you can see Sukkot to Etam, you're on the edge of the wilderness, Ramses, Sukkot, Etam, and then there's this turning back, and when they turn back, they're by a place called Migdal, and that is near the sea. So we should be not too far from where they started at that point. And then we have this business of the three-day journey, which could be three days plus the following, or even if the three days are the free, free, three first stops, take your pick. Uh, scholars are, are completely uh, uncertain about that. Now, this gives us, this data gives us some approximate distances. Working on the 20 miles a day average, uh, Ramses to Sukkot, camp spot number one, to Etam, then turning back to Migdal by the sea, three days, should be about 60 miles traveled. Again, it could be a little more, it could be less. I have a feeling the first day they may have covered a lot more as they were highly motivated to get out of there. Now, the distance from the sea to Mount Sinai, as I said before, could be eight days minimally, 11 days maximally, which means a distance of 160 to 220 miles. Now, again, bear in mind, this is all as the crow flies, but we're not talking about crows flying here. So, you know, roads wind, and uh, it might look shorter on a map, but really could be longer depending on, on the terrain and so on. But these are just general numbers that we can work with. 
Then we have the datum I mentioned previously, that Mount Sinai, or Mount Horeb as it's also called, is an 11 day journey, which means it should be somewhere around 220 kilometers. Uh, miles, I'm sorry, I'm in America. I was kilometers two days ago. <laughs> okay. If we place a circle around a 60 mile radius from Ramesses, you can see the potential range of where 60 miles will get you. But that, again, is a straight line, and that doesn't take into account the turning back, how much away from their original destination uh, they turn, or their, their starting point. Now, we have to deal with this old thorny issue of what is the body of water through which the Israelites passed. The Hebrew text names this body of water Yam Suf, Sea of Reeds. There's no doubt that Yam Suf means Sea of Reeds because the reeds are the very thing that Moses' mama placed his basket in the reeds of the Nile. Same word. Now, the really complicated thing about this is that the Bible also uses the term Yam Suf to refer to the Gulf of Aqaba. The Gulf of Aqaba being the north and eastern branch of or arm of the Red Sea over on the other side of Sinai, over Dr. Long's territory there in Jordan and Arabia. And remember, some people on that map I showed you had the Israelites crossing the Gulf of Aqaba and going into Arabia. These are all references to uh, that name. Some of the places just simply referred to the body of water they crossed as the sea, whereas others call it Yam Suf, Sea of Reeds. Okay, all those, these references. Okay. Long, long ago, it was established linguistically that the Hebrew word suf was cognate with the Egyptian word tuf. I know it sounds maybe very different to our ears, but it isn't. Um, the Hebrew word suf is cognate, that it's linguistically connected to the Egyptian word suf for reeds or rushes. Now, this, this reference to suf or chuf in Egyptian language consistently refers to a body of water on the northeastern frontier of Egypt. Um, I'm only going to cite one source here tonight, but we have a document called the Anamastikon of Amenemope. An Anamastikon means a list of names. So we have this list, and this list goes from the very southern part of Egypt of cities and important geographical areas, and it goes from the very south to the very north. So the list begins uh, at the southern border of Egypt, which is a little island called Biga Island, right uh, beside Aswan, the official boundary of Egypt, the border, southern border of Egypt in ancient times. Now we're gonna fast forward and get all the way up to the area of Cairo today, and that's where the city of Memphis was before it ever was in Tennessee, and it's number 394 in this sequence. So we've moved all the way from Egypt's southern end all the way up to the base of the delta. Now we're going to keep moving, and 410 is the city of Ramses that we've talked about and located. 417 is Tanis, a little further to the north. 418 is the sea, Patufi. And why this sea is, body of water is included here, uh, is, is a little puzzling because almost all the other places mentioned on this list are cities. The last place mentioned on this list is called Charu or Sile, which we know to be the frontier town, the border of Egypt and Sinai. Now, I was asked earlier today what I felt my greatest contribution was to uh, the question of the Exodus. And I think the most important thing I did was hire a geologist to work with me and make maps based on the ancient topography, uh, fascinating work, and we've come up with uh, this map. And you can see uh, Ramesses over here charted out where ancient branches of the Nile were. We actually found a Nile branch over here by the site we excavated. And here, way at the very north, this, this little cluster of sites are two big forts at what the Egyptians called Charu, later texts refer to as Sile. This was the frontier town of Egypt. 
And, but remember, it's the last place, the northmost place on this list of geographical uh, locations. And before it and south of it is what the Egyptians called the, the reed marshes. And that's why I've suggested that the ancient Balakh lakes right in here is the biblical sea of reeds. I'm not the first to suggest this. This was proposed by a man I uh, greatly admire, uh, Professor Manfred Bitak uh, uh, from the University of Vienna. He's proposed this many years ago, and I completely agree with, with his identification and the reasons for his identifications. Now, we did a lot of work, which we've just published in this past year, this year, on the formation and the parameters of this lake. And what's interesting about it, you can see here that the lake is really made up of several uh, large portions. The entire distance here, we're talking is about uh, 12, 13, 14 miles. So it, it's not a small place. But uh, the uh, one thing we've learned is that there was a Nile branch that flowed through it, somehow ca came across here. And so these waters were fed by a Nile branch and the levels of the water would fluctuate depending on the time of year. So during the months of August, September, October, when the Nile flooded every year, this place was, was really lots of water in it. It was turned in from three large lakes into a sea. And so the, the picture could vary depending on the time of year. So uh, uh, there you have it. Uh, here's Ramses. Um, down here, and we'll, so I'm just showing you the sort of the raw data, then we'll get to another map in a moment. Uh, this is where the site of Sukkot is located. And we identify this based on the fact that there's a little village there today, and its Arabic name, Maskuta, preserves the ancient name Sukkot. You see that? Sukuta, Maskuta, Sukkot. The pharaonic name was Chaku, Saku, something like that. So uh, that seems to be the direction they're going. Now, this is my geologist buddy who's helped make me famous, and I appreciate it, Dr. Stephen Mosier. There are sections of the ancient Balakh Lake on the west side of the Suez Canal where the reeds still grow, and you can see how huge they are and why it might have been called the seed of reeds in ancient times. Now, on the other side of the Suez Canal, there's a lot less water today, and it's a desert, and that's where most of this area is. And here we are collaborating with an Egyptian geologist with the Geological Survey. It was one of these providential things. The former director of the Geological Survey, uh, we had contacted and said, could you provide a geologist to work with us? And he sent us this man. He's a Presbyterian elder in his church in Cairo. It was a wonderful collaboration. We've been good friends ever since, Dr. Baha Gayed. Anyway, here we are drilling into the, the basin of the Balakh Lake. And so that's how we gathered a lot of our data about the history. And if you're really interested, you can read uh, Tell El Borg volume two all about that. So here's what it looks like on a map, if we're tracking then, movement from Kantir to Ramesses. And we're told, uh, remember that, uh, that in Exodus 13, 17, they didn't go by the most obvious way out of Egypt, uh, which is a route that would have carried them this way lest they see war and turn back. Seems like a good idea, we don't wanna see war. So they went another way, which happens to be the only other route one could safely get out of Egypt. And this route uh, would have been to go out here. And by the way, in the Bible, that route is called the, the way of Shur, the road of Shur. And that's the one that figures prominently in the Genesis stories. That's the road that Hagar is on when she nearly dies and Ishmael nearly dies. It's called the Way of Shur, the Road of Shur. So I, I can't get into that too much, but there were two main roads out of Egypt. And it's clear at this point that God is leading them this way. But at this point, at the edge of the wilderness, they're about to cross and God says, turn back. And I know it doesn't make sense. And I said this very line here last time I was here. It doesn't make any sense, but it's good for preaching. Because it seems that there is a logical, you're, you're there, you're out. And God says, eh, one more test. And he turns them back right to that area they were originally seeking to avoid. In other words, take them right back up to uh, this area that was the focus of our research for more than a decade. Now, again, I'm not trying to get caught up in here. I'm just trying to 
get you to uh, some more important reference points, because we're trying to get to Mount Sinai, we're, and we have to leave Egypt to do that. So this was a map I had made that was published in Biblical Archaeology Review some years ago, and it's pretty close to what I had in mind, but that's the general idea. All right. So we know where Ramses is on the left top of your picture. On the top right, Kadesh Barnea. There are two sites within a few miles of each other. One is called Ein Kudirat. Ein means well, spring. There's a spring of water there. Remember, most of the time the Israelites spent in the book of Numbers was in and around Kadesh Barnea because there's a perennial source of water there. Water is very important in the desert. There is another spring just a few miles to the south, and the Arabic name is Ain, again, same word, spring, Kadis. Kadis is the Arabic word that corresponds to Kadesh, holy. And so some have thought it's Ain Kadis. The problem with Ain Kadis is it's very small and the water is not very good. It doesn't flow very well. On the other hand, uh, the other location is much more plausible. Now again, we draw our 220 mile circuit for the 11 day journey from Kadesh Barnea, and you can see the range that we could, and again, remember, this is a straight line, but they're not traveling in a straight line, okay? Just keep that in mind. But it does mean that anywhere in this, in this area seems to be plausible. I'll just take you quickly to the area of Kadesh Barnea. It's very hard to get there. I, we had to get special permission. You have to go through UN checkpoints. It's quite an ordeal to get there. We had a flat tire on the way. And this is the area known as the Wilderness of Paran, which leads to Kadesh Barnea. And you can see in the middle of this desert where everything's brown or yellow, dry, it's green. Um, and the building, the edge of which is seen on the bottom left-hand corner of the picture, is the edge of a Judean fort. From the 10th century down to about 586 BC when Jerusalem fell, there were a series of three forts. For whatever reason, the Judeans from either Solomon's day or a little after Solomon's day thought this was an important enough place to defend. Uh, and we're not sure why. It had to do with trade, caravans. We're not, nobody really knows for sure. But you can see it's a very uh, lush place. There's water and, and people can survive here. All right. So that's Kadesh Barnea. Now, I want to address the question, is Mount Sinai in Arabia? I'm sure some of you have heard lectures, seen videos. Uh, there's a new one going around right now, very slickly done, very impressively done, promoting this uh, proposal. It starts with Galatians 4:24 4, to 25, which, in which Paul says, now this is an allegory. Now, I don't know how, how you do hermeneutics down here, but if the author says we're dealing in allegory, we don't take what follows literally. <laughs> Just saying. At least that's the way we are at Trinity. He's talking about Sarah and Hagar as symbols. The one is Mount Sinai. Well, clearly, uh, bearing children for slavery. She is Hagar. Now, Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. She corresponds to present-day Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. Well, that's pretty hard to beat. It's in, it's in Arabia. That settles it. The problem is we're talking about Paul in the first century sometime, middle of the first century. The question should not be, where is, Mount, where is Arabia on a modern geopolitical map? Is where is Arabia in Paul's day? As early as the Greek historian Herodotus, around 450 BC. He traveled to Egypt and from there crossed Sinai and went into to Palestine. And he reports that when you leave Egypt and come to what we call Sinai, he ref referred to it as Sinai Arabiacus, Sinai of Arabia. In other words, Sinai was considered to be part of Arabia. Now here's a really, really cool map dating to the 8th century AD. Uh, by a monk named Beatus. Beatus was, uh, made a map of, of the known world based on the Bible. And uh, what's interesting is he makes the Red Sea red down here, or at least salmon color. But then look how old this picture is. And we have the Jordan River and the Sea of Galilee, the Dead Sea. And, and here's Egypt. Here's the Nile. And right on the cross here, we see this is Sinai Arabia, Sinai Arabia. And so this whole area is called Arabia. 
So from, the, from Greek times down to Paul's times, the term Arabia applied to Sinai. It doesn't necessarily mean Arabia of present day maps, which were drawn at the end of World War I, okay? So that's a, a, the first misstep by those advocating that. Here's just a closer look, the reference to Arabia here. And even the body of water here is called Sinaius Arabiacus. So that's right beside Egypt, okay? All right. The choice mountain of mounts for Mount Sinai for those advocating the Arabian connection is a mountain called Jebel al Laos. By the way, sometimes you see the word Jebel, sometimes you see the word Gebel. If you're an Egyptian, you say Gebel. If you're Jordanian or Arab, you say Jebel. Okay, same thing, it means mountain. Laos, uh, well, it's a lousy choice, but uh, Laos means almonds. So I don't know why it's called Mount Almonds because it doesn't look like there's any almonds there to me. But <laughs> Those who have advocated this are fascinated by the black top to this mountain and actually propose that the, the effect of the glory of God and the fire of the mountain was such that this all turned black. And it escapes me how Moses didn't have the beard of his hair singed. You know, it could change the color of the mountain, but it couldn't change. And maybe he got a tan out of the deal, I don't know. But in any event, uh, this all looks very impressive to the layperson. Look at this black, but you travel all over Sinai and parts of Arabia, you'll find the same phenomenon. So either God was all over the place or now, um, okay, I thought I had something else here. Maybe we'll come to it. Now, to get to this location, there are two different proposed Red Sea crossings by, again, there are different people advocating the mountain, but different ways of getting there, okay? The one proposal is to have them go across like this, way down here and cross here and then go to the Jebel Laos. Now, why is that a problem? We've already established, based on the biblical data, that it's a maximum of three days travel to get from the, Mount, from the Ramesses to the sea, but at least eight and maybe 11 days to travel from when you cross the sea to get to Mount Sinai. This is backwards, right? It's very close from the crossing sea to the mountain and way, way too far to travel in three days. The other is to go down this way and cross and up. Either way, uh, the distance is just to travel. Here are some of the intrepid uh, proposal, proposers of these theories. Um, Ron Wyatt, the late Ron Wyatt, a nurse anesthetist. I love nurses who put you to sleep. Um, Bob Cornuck, former uh, LA SWAT policeman, become real, real estate mogul. And Dr. Leonard Moeller, a radiologist. Uh, great qualifications for other fields, but not archaeology <laughs> and biblical studies. Okay, sorry, I don't mean to demean them, but, okay, sorry. So the distance for these routes is in the neighborhood of 300 miles. And if you can do that in three days, 100 miles a day walking with your sheep and goats, you're not going to make it. This is like me trying to get to my plane yesterday. I was going as fast as I could. I was the last one on the plane in London. But anyway, but I had to get here. Okay. So there you can see the problem. It's getting there in three days. Now, again, one would have to assume then that the Bible isn't giving us a stage-by-stage -stage reporting as it's claimed in Numbers 33. This is a stage-by-stage -stage record. So I'm taking that seriously. So now there's another factor here. And that is that the Bible clear, by the way, part of the argument is that Arabia is what the Bible calls the land of Midian. And that's where Moses fled to in Exodus chapter two. Now, uh, here you, here's what we're talking about. Moses flees, he, Pharaoh's out to get him, and Moses fled and went to the land of Midian. And uh, that's where he uh, meets up with his wife to be. So, that, the land of Midian is in Saudi Arabia, and most of your Bible atlases will place Midian here. But that is not the only uh, area of what is Midian here. In Numbers 22, the story about Balaam, when the Israelites are up north of, or the north end of the, de the Dead Sea, they're about to go into the Promised Land. And what do we find out? Moab said to the elders of, the Midian, of Midian, and he refers to uh, one of the collaborators against the Israelites 
were the, were the Midianites. And you can read about that in Numbers 22. And it was a Midianite woman that was engaged in, in the sexual acts that got, got her killed along with the Israelites by Phineas in his fervor for the Lord. So that means we have Midianites all the way up to the land of Moab. Well, they're a nomadic people. They move seasonally. So the Midianite homeland may be in Arabia, but they could also be as far north as the northern end of the Dead Sea. Now, here is a key passage. Moses and the Israelites have been at Mount Sinai for a little over a year. It's time to move on. They've got the law. They've got their tabernacle built. They've got the wings right, just perfect on the Ark of the Covenant. And they're ready to go. And Moses says to his brother-in-law, Hobab, the son of Ruel, hey, you know, you really know this area. You know the turf. You know how to live in it. Come along with us. Be a guide for us. Uh, we'll treat you well. We'll give you a home among us. And look at, and this is at Mount Sinai, okay? N Numbers chapter 10. He said, very last line, no, I'm not going to go with you. I will depart to my own land and to my own kindred. Very clearly, when he was at Mount Sinai, he was not in the land of Midian. He says, I'm going to go back to my people. I'm going to go back to Midian. So clearly, Midian is not where Mount Sinai was. And that's critical to the argument. Okay. There's another factor that really is a problem for traveling to um, the crossing points proposed by several uh, as the northern end or right in the middle of the Gulf Aqaba. This area where the uh, circle is, is the most desolate part of the wilderness. And you can see all those white lines. These are wadis. These are ancient uh, and continue to be used streams. When you rarely get a rain, these become small little rivers that flow. And so the terrain is like this, up and down, up and down. And to travel across that, not only is that hard for you on foot, you can't imagine Pharaoh's chariots bouncing along across this terrain. It just will not work. It just will not work. Uh, thanks to uh, Google Maps, I trekked from Kantir to, uh, well, we'll come back to that later. But this, I, 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 it's fun to play with, with, with the current roads because most of the ancient roads correspond to present day roads just because of the geographical consideration. There is a road now across this area, uh, so you can see that. But to the best of our knowledge, there was no such road in ancient times. So it would mean the Israelites were going where there was no roads and the chariots, uh, which I find very hard to believe. Okay. Now back to our mountain again. This is a geological map of that black stuff we saw. And my geologist buddy, Stephen Mosier, looked at it and said, oh, well, no wonder it looks black on the top. It's, it's, and he looks at it, the geological map will show you that we have slate, uh, a, a kind of greenstone. These are all igneous rock uh, formations. And that's why it's black. There was not some miraculous phenomenon that occurred. It's this granite, solid granite through and through. So, and so now when you look at it this way, uh, the other thing you can see in looking at the close-up is you can actually see some of the geological intrusions running through the black. So anyway, there it is. Look at those are, anyway. All right, we'll leave the geology. We're going to go on to another mountain. And this is a ultra north mountain, which the Red Sea is, or the sea is crossed here to go to this mountain. It's about 40 miles from crossing the sea to this mountain, which is two days journey, not 11 day journey or an eight day journey after crossing the sea. And, sorry, it's 30 miles from this mountain to Kadesh Barnea, not an 11 day journey, okay? That's the way I'm, I process this, looking at the data. Okay, so here is Kadesh Barnea. There's another mountain, oops, sorry, I hit the button, I got two, two for one. Um, okay, so there, there's there's Kadesh Barnea that we're talking about. There's Ein Kadis, the other site I mentioned about close by. Another location that's received some attention, and I actually met a woman in Australia who's writing her doctoral dissertation on this, uh, which I find hard to believe that somebody would promote it, but anyway, they are. Um, this is, is that mountain, Gebel Harkom, uh, and 
you know, the major problem is it's, it's about one day's journey from Kadesh Barnea. It, it just won't work. Another proposed mountain is one called Gebel Sin Bisher. And it's proposed by, and those of you who know Hebrew in the crowd will get a, a chuckle out of this. He's an ge Israeli geographer. His name is Har El. Har El means mountain of God. That's his name, and he's trying to find the mountain of God, which I think is pretty cool. But anyway, um, his proposal in his book on the, on the Sinai journeys is Gebel Sin Bisher. And he thinks that the word sin preserves the name Sinai for Mount Sinai. And, um, and this mountain, you can see, uh, is rather impressive. Um, the Arabic word sin is also the word for teeth. I think it looks like old man Bisher's teeth, but anyway, well, well who knows. But that mountain uh, would require one to cross the sea here, which is plausible, I think, and then going down and then turning in up here at Gebel Sin Bisher, and then somehow cutting across because Deuteronomy tells us that the, the trek took them to uh, Etzion Gebir, right on the northern edge of the Gulf of Aqaba in the land of Seir or Edom before they turned up this way, probably to take this route. Uh, so this candidate, I think, possibly works. And a, a number of scholars have, have come on board on this one. Um, I can say that none of these mountains have produced any datable archaeological evidence to the general period we would place Moses, anywhere, say, from uh, 1450 down to 1200. None of them have any archaeological evidence. So no one can say, well, we got pottery from this day. They don't. They don't. So this one's possible. I, by the way, I visited and took that picture on Y2K day. That's why I'll never forget it. I was looking around for it with a map and finally found it. So, all right, so there's, there is that Again, it's plausible, especially because the distance here. But again, uh, this would require traveling a very, very hard route. And we don't even know if it was there. You will see some maps showing this route called Darb al Hag or Darb al Hajj. And this was a road that was made uh, after the, well, 700s AD for pilgrims going from Egypt to Mecca. The Hajj is the pilgrimage. They were going across Sinai and down into Arabia for the pilgrimage. That's the earliest we have any evidence of this as a road because it was so difficult. Now, south central locations for Sinai, we have more. Serebit al Qadim down here. Uh, I only know of one book that actually believes this. It's a wonderful place to visit. Uh, here's my visit. Uh, some years ago, I went there to make a film for the BBC that ended up, I think, on the Discovery Channel. There are even bushes that can burn. Whoops, they do burn. Oh, anyway, we staged this for the movie. We, we dumped some gasoline on it, so we got our burning bush. <laughs> and you come to the mountain of Sirabit al Qadim, and you see this uh, beautiful mountain sticking up. And this is where the Egyptians mined for turquoise. Um, in order to get there, we had to go through windy valleys, and we were in a four by four, uh, I think it was a Toyota Land Cruiser of some sort, and we had a Bedouin driver with us. And the director, who was from Britain, thought it'd be really great to get this very dramatic shot of us coming over this hill and down this very steep mountain that was covered with sand. And uh, they set up their cameras to the bottom and waited for us, and we're driving around the back for this shot. You know, directors have these great egos. But anyway, I first said, look, you know, this is a little scary. I, you know, I, I don't think this is really safe. The director said, look, we'll get one of the Bedouin boys to wear your hat. We'll film in profile. And I said, no, I do my own stunts. <laughs> so we started off, came up the mountain. I'm talking Arabic to the guy. I speak Arabic pretty well. And I'll, I'll just speak in English to you. But I said, you know, this looks very dangerous. Aren't you a little fearful of driving up and down this thing? He said, no, no, I'm not. Okay, you got a four-wheel drive. And as we get to the top, we're looking down. It's, Whoa, it's a lot steeper from the top than it is the bottom. <laughs> and I said, look, be careful. I don't want to die today. I have a wife and two kids. He said, don't worry. I don't want to die today. I've got three wives and 15 kids. <laughs> 
So we made it to the bottom, and wouldn't you, wouldn't you guess it? The director says, can we do another roll of that? And the driver said, no. <laughs> he didn't want to do it. Anyway, at Sirabit al Qadam, there's a beautiful temple. Here the Egyptians came for uh, close to 2,000 years to mine turquoise. This and these caves, and this, well, this temple is to the goddess Hathor, responsible for turquoise. There she is. And here you can see turquoise, uh, the sort of stuff that the Egyptians went for and used in Egyptian jewelry. And wouldn't you know it that one of the names of the gemstones in the high priest's breastplate is the Egyptian word for turquoise. And to me, that's one of the coolest little things to realize when it's in Sinai, it's the only place in the ancient world where turquoise was mined. So they were there. And after 1200 BC, the Egyptians stopped mining there. And we ceased to find turquoise in jewelry and in excavations. Ju uh, turquoise just doesn't show up anymore because the main source for it had dried up. All right, I could tell you another story there, but I won't because we're running out of time. We have more mountains to get to. Okay, the, there are caves where the, the mining took place. And within them are some of the oldest writings in an alphabetic Semitic script. You can see scratch and wall called proto sinaitic And here's a text that actually reads El Olam, God the Eternal. This is one of the names of God we find in the patriarchal narratives. So rather interesting. So, um, so that was Sirabit al Qadim. The other, and this is more uh, within the traditional framework of suggested mountains, is that there is a wadi, a valley, called the Wadi Firan, that leads into two more candidates we'll look at, Gebel Sirbal and, of course, Gebel Musa. Oops, sorry. This is Wadi Firan. It's probably the most prolific green area of all of Sinai. And it's hard to believe the Israelites weren't here. In fact, tradition has it that this is where we had the famous battle with the Amalekites. And what was it about? Water because water is so limited in Sinai. And this is one of the most uh, fruitful areas you can see by all the palm trees growing. There are actually early Christians who built monasteries here uh, in, to commemorate the acts of God in this area. Coming through this valley, you can see a large granite mountain over the top, and that's Mount Sirbal or Gebel Sirbal. Here's a Google Earth image of it, very impressive mountain. Some of the early explorers, 19th century explorers, thought this was Mount Sinai, and so did a lot of ancient people. There are hundreds of graffiti carved around this mountain uh, from the 6th century AD, uh, 7th century, mostly in Armenian, Armenian Christians coming on pilgrimages. So somebody thought this was Mount Sinai, um, and that the wadi just on the other side, the valley, was... Uh, the Valley of, of Rephidim. Okay. Now, if you don't buy that mountain, you'd still go through that same valley and go another day's journey to get to traditional Mount Sinai. Now, I don't know, I imagine there are some people here who have climbed Mount Sinai, Gebel and Musa, got a show of hands. Anybody climbed this mountain? My wife. Really? Don't you guys go to Sinai? Oh, boy. Okay. Well, I took my rabbi friend there and... His response, usually you, if you climb, you go at like two in the morning, so that you're up there for sunrise, and there are thousands of people up there, Koreans and Greeks and singing hymns, and it's a wonderful place to go, and you see the sun rising. It's the traditional spot of, of Mount Sinai. <laughs> and my rabbi, when he, when he came back, he said to me, I never believed that was Mount Sinai, but now that I've climbed it, it is. <laughs> <laughs> And you might feel that way too. I've climbed it four times and that's it. I'm not doing it again. I'll point you on the path. I'll, I'll get you a guide. But this is traditional Mount Moses, Gabal Musa. Again, early explorers, Christian explorers, non-Christian geographers came here. They liked it. Uh, this is um, Gabal Mu uh, the front end. This is the valley that leads to the St. Catherine's Monastery. And there's this huge open plain here We'll look at it. Here's another view from Google Earth, and you can see the monastery here. And basically, you have a saddle here. The front end is called an Arabic Gebel Safsafa. The back is called Gebel Musa, Mount Moses. And if you take a look, there's Gebel Safsafa close up. 
Here's a rendering of this by David Roberts, I think in 1842 or 1837, looking at the monastery and out to this vast plain, which uh, some people thought that's where the Israelite camp was, where the tabernacle was, all of that with Mount Sinai in the background. Here's the back end of that. You can climb all the way up to this little chapel at the top. In between her is this saddle. And this is where, uh, again, those who, if you talk to the monks, they'll say, this is where Moses and the 70 elders met and ate and dined in the presence of God as they looked up further on the mountain. They didn't go to the tippy top, but were in this area. And there's a little chapel where they believe Elijah came years later and had his little encounter. This is a chapel that we saw from the ground. St. Catherine's Monastery, of course, has been at this location since the fourth century. It was thought to be the place of the burning bush. And there's a chapel here. And there is a plant that's growing. And the monks will swear on a stack of Bibles 10 feet tall or 10 Codex Sinaiticuses that it's the real, it's the real deal. Now, I did not believe this until I took a group of tourists some years ago, my friend reached up to touch it and a bolt of lightning shot down at him <laughs> or something. I don't know what happened, but we saw this picture and said, uh-oh, something's going on here. Maybe there is something to this. I, if anybody has a photographic explanation, I'd love to hear it. But there he is, my friend Steve, uh, and he didn't know what happened. But anyway, all right. It's a beautiful place to go and, uh, you know, whether... It, it is or isn't, doesn't matter. It's a great place to go. If for no other reason than Christians have been going there for 1,500 years to pray and, and, and try to get closer to God. Now, this is our, our checklist. Gebel allows in Arabia. The problem is threefold. One, the major problem is the distance from Ramesses to the sea, 300 miles. That should be around 60. 40 to 50 miles from the sea to the mountain the distance from there to Kadesh Barnea fits 200 miles. So that's the only thing that works in terms of the biblical data. Gabal Halal, we can throw that out uh, for, for all the distance issues. Har Karkom is only 30 miles from, K from Kadesh Barnea to uh, Kadesh uh, and the mountain. Gabal Sin Bisher, I put a question mark because it's very hard uh, to reckon here uh, because it has to do with it would only be 100 miles to get there if you cross the Bitter Lake. If you cross further north, uh, my proposed Red Sea, it's 150 miles, and the distance is okay. Uh, it works. It's about 200 miles to Kadesh Barnea. So I would, I would say this is a possibility. Uh, uh, Gebel Sirbal, okay on all points in terms of the biblical distance data. Gebel Musa, again, okay. It fits within all the acceptable ranges. This leads me to believe that we can say with at least biblical certainty that somewhere in the southern part of Sinai is the best uh, location in terms of the biblical data of campsites and distance. Now, why it doesn't matter. The importance of Mount Sinai, of course, is that God appeared there to his people, his glory, appeared on the mountain. Uh, Exodus 24, 16 says, the glory of the Lord settled on the mountain. That word in Hebrew is shakan. And it's from the word shakan that we get the word tabernacle, mishkan. The very next uh, passage, now the appearance of the, of, of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on the top of the mountain in the sight of the people of Israel. Now that's chapter 24. The glory of God comes down, settles, uh, tabernacles, if you will, on the mountain. And then in chapter 25, God gives the instructions to make the Mishkan, the tabernacle. And uh, Exodus 25, 8, let them make a sanctuary, a holy place, that I may shakan, dwell in their midst. And that word uh, for the dwelling place is the Mishkan, the dwelling place. So God wants to camp, as it were, amongst his people. The book of Exodus ends with the glory of the Lord filling the tabernacle. And you know, when you read the narratives from then through the book of Numbers, how the glory of the Lord would move and they would follow and then set up camp once again, the glory of the Lord would occupy the Holy of Holies. And then that happened all the way till they get to the promised land. 
Interesting thing is once the tabernacle is set up and the glory of God occupies it, never again does, Mount, does Moses go up the mountain again. In other words, the tabernacle becomes a place for God's glory to meet with Moses or the priests. Now, it was years later, centuries later, that David had this idea to build a temple. It was not God's idea. It's interesting. Uh, humans, we like building big things and we think we're doing it to honor God. God was perfectly happy to be in an old tattered tent. And a reason given here is, look, I can move around and be close to the people. I don't have to be in some big building. But God says, okay. So, in a sense then, the tabernacle is the architectural prototype for the temple. It's based on the same plan, just larger scale. And when the temple was constructed around 960 BC, the tabernacle was replaced. And in one verse, we find out that the old tent was still around. And we're told in 1 Kings 8, 4 and 11, all the elders came and the priests took up the ark and they brought the ark of the Lord, the tent of meeting and all the holy vessels that were in the tent. The, I don't know where it went, but we're told here that the old tent, can you imagine, after all those hundreds of years, was folded up and the poles and somehow taken into the temple. As if to say, the glory of God that, the glory of God that we had in this tent is now going to be in the temple. And sure enough, we then read, the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. So God's glory that first appeared on Mount Sinai moved into the tabernacle, moved with the people, and finally ends up in the, uh, the glorious temple of Solomon, the ESV official uh, plan of which you see here. I, I was a consultant for it, but I won't bore you with more stories unless you like my stories. But uh, it's getting late, so let's move on. Psalm 78 tells us, He chose, that is God, the tribe of Judah, Mount Zion, which He loves. He built his sanctuary like the high heavens, like the earth, which he founded forever. So in a sense, Mount Zion in Jerusalem becomes the new Mount Sinai. You'll notice that other than Elijah, we have no record of anyone in the Bible going back to Mount Sinai. It was not a place that people went for pilgrimages. They were going to Jerusalem because where God's glory appeared is not so important as where God's glory is. We read in the book of Ezekiel the very sad report that God's glory departed from the temple in 586 B.C. And when that glory departed, we never read of it coming back again until the incarnation. And in John 1, we read God's glory, about God's glory, that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We have seen His glory as the only Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. He became flesh and literally, the word for tent is used there in Greek, skene, he tented, he tabernacled amongst us. So God's new tabernacle, his new appearance of the glory of God, of course, was in Jesus Christ. So where Mount Sinai is, is a really is not important. The question is, what's your relationship with the incarnate glory of God in Jesus Christ? That becomes the real question, and why where Mount Sinai is really doesn't matter. It's interesting, but it doesn't matter. Thank you very much. Thank you for a wonderful, wonderful presentation. Thank you. I feel like I walked all those places. I'm sweating a little bit. Ah, just a little bit. You have really exerted yourself uh, this, uh, through the day. I have a question for you as we're waiting for questions to, uh, to come in. Uh, this afternoon, you made a presentation to students and faculty about the Egyptianizing influence on Israel when they're were in Egypt and the significance, uh, and I was especially impressed with your presentation 
can you summarize a few key points and the significance of what you were saying this afternoon? Sure, we'll have an hour. <laughs> yeah, well, my, my, my point was that we have no direct evidence of Israel in Egypt, no archeological evidence, no inscription saying Moses slept here, that sort of thing. But what we do have a lot of evidence of in the Bible is that Egypt infiltrated the Bible and that's largely, I believe, because of the cultural assimilation, the things that the, you know, when you live in another culture, I imagine if I'm down here six months, I'll be saying y'all, right? <laughs> uh, so things like that happen. People acculturate, they accommodate, they, they, they try to blend in. And so to a certain degree, um, uh, any minority community is going to uh, adapt and adopt certain things, and certain things are just say, we, we don't do that, we, we can't do that. And so uh, there are a number of indications. Um, uh, I think the most important thing, the take, one of the most important takeaways is that at the time of Moses, there were two competing writing systems in the world. The Babylonians and the Northern uh, Syrian people like the people at Ugarit wrote on clay tablets and they wrote in cuneiform. But we find Moses throughout, starting in, in Exodus, uh, Deuteronomy, uh, and it says he wrote them in a book. And the word safer uh, would be understood as a scroll. And in essence, the Israelites from, from their inception used uh, papyrus as this, a surface on which they wrote. And we know this uh, in later time because we have the little clay seals that are found in Jerusalem and they have a stamp with the name of the scribe or the official or the king, they have a couple with, a couple with Hezekiah's name on them. And so um, on the underside, you can see the, the impression of papyrus. So we know what they were writing on. So they, they, one of the things I think they came up with was the, the mode of writing that was used in Egypt, number one. Number two, I think there were a number of things that um, they simply bought into simply because they had to. Uh, you notice that in Exodus 16, just after crossing the sea, remember the story about the first time manna is provided? And God says, okay, you know, for six days you go out and collect it, and the seventh day you're not going to get any, it's a Sabbath. Well, why is he introducing that there? In Exodus 20, we have the Sabbath day making it holy, etc. In Egypt, there was no seven day week. They had 10 day, is that me crackling? Uh, they had a 10 day, if you will, week with no weekend. And they had three 10 day work cycles that made up a month, 30 days a month. But they did get religious holidays quite frequently. And I think Moses was trying to get that same deal for his people. Hey, give us one of those, give us three days to go worship our God. And but they, they didn't, they had simply adopt what, if they had a seven day week in Abraham's day, they didn't have it in Moses' day because living in Egypt, they had to work within that system. So God had to reintroduce them to the seven day week and the Sabbath concept. So there's a lot of things like that where you can see Egypt's imprint on their culture. Uh, we have um, a number of Israelites leaving at the Exodus who have Egyptian names. And a number of them are people that are pretty well known in the Bible, like Hur, you know, Aaron and Hur, Ben Hur, that name Hur is for the god Horus. We have a number, four that I can count on, names in the Bible of, of priests who have the name Hur in it, which is really bizarre because it's the name of the Egyptian sky god Horus. So clearly they've, they may have even adapted some Egyptian religious belief Maybe that's what the golden calf is. It's something they had known in Egypt and now they're trying to translate their, their new God by using old images and God says, uh-uh, that one, that one won't work. So while there is no archeological evidence of Israel in Egypt, biblical text implies that they were in Egypt. That, that's my argument. That's your, that's that's your argument. argument. So I, I, my line is, there's no evidence of, of the Hebrews in Egypt. There's evidence of Egypt in the Hebrew scriptures. Like the conference on, yeah, conference on the tabernacle. Can you highlight uh, Egyptian parallels and maybe 
maybe especially, uh, it's interesting to me, parallels between the camp of Ramses, military camp of Ramses II and the right, tabernacle. Right. Can you expound yeah, on that? Yeah, well, that's best done with pictures, but um, we'll, we'll give it a whirl here. The, the tabernacle, you have to understand, is a portable temple, small-scale portable temple. And of course, with Solomon, that became a permanent temple, no longer portable. And in Egypt, there were a number of these portable temples. And what I suggested in my lecture this afternoon is the technology of how to build tabernacles was something that would have been known by the people because of, of what the Egyptians did. Uh, the Egyptians were masters of, of making things out of wood and covering them with gold. The technology of the sort of things you read in the tabernacle was, was basic Egyptian artisanship. And um, the thing you're referring to is that the, the, when Pharaoh Ramses II went off to war, he, he left us a number of depictions of his camp and his tent that he lived in, in the middle of the camp, surrounded by a wall. And the, this is something that was carted along into battle, set up, and the king you know, held court. And the way his tent is structured is a, the, the distance of the ratio of its length to its width is a two to one ratio, which is basically the same ratio as you have for the tabernacle, the width to length, and so on. So there are a number of interesting parallels about the structure. And I would simply say that I wouldn't be surprised if, if Bezalel, the, the architect that God gave great wisdom to make the, the tabernacle, would not have been an artisan who worked in Egypt and knew some of the technology and was simply using the good things he had learned in, a, in an even better way. Here's a question that uh, I think highlights your work. Is there any archaeological evidence? Well, uh, this is the, uh, another card, but is, first of all, is there any archaeological evidence of chariot wheels in the sea? And, uh, if there were, I would have mentioned it. Yes. <laughs> um, so, yes, well, the, the, there are some pictures floating around the internet uh, from our friend Ron Wyatt. And uh, back in 1980, I don't know what it was, Bob Cornuck, who I showed his picture up there, came to Wheaton College, and he was trying to tout these discoveries and uh, was trying to get me, I was just a young professor at the time, and my senior colleague, Alfred Hurt, uh, on their bandwagon. We found this evidence. Okay, show us. Show us pictures. Show us your data. Well, we can't show you. But you disbelieve us. I, sorry, I don't believe you. So the one picture that is floating around the internet shows these, what purports, purports to be wheels, and it says digitally enhanced. <laughs> I'll leave it there. Okay. Here's the question I think that highlights uh, your work. How does the change of the climate over uh, several thousand years, how has it affected your work? Well, it's, it's not a, well, the way it's affected our work is that um, the, the Nile Delta and its formation changes largely because of rains in Central Africa. So the Nile flows based on what happens in Central Africa. So the droughts, most of the droughts that we read about in the Bible that led Abraham to go to Egypt in Genesis 12 was because lack of rain in Canaan. But because the rains in Central Africa were still fine, the Nile was great. The only problem is in the Bible, like in, jo in, Josh in jo Joseph's day, when the rains in Central Africa must have been curtailed, and this led to lower Nile so that even Egypt was going through problems. But these are cyclical things that, that can be studied, and the way they've been studied, interestingly enough, is by studying ice cores from Mount Kilimanjaro. And these have helped uh, determine when there were periods of drought in Africa, which would have affected the flow of the Nile. And they believe they have one that dates roughly to the time of Joseph that could account for those lean years that uh, are mentioned in, in, in the book of Genesis. So um, the way things have been affected most is um, there's a combination of things. And it's not all climate related. The branches of the Nile that flowed especially out of the eastern delta. And we discovered a branch of the Nile in our work in North Sinai. The waters of that seem to cut off, but the reasons seem to be not climate related, but tectonics. That is the area there is a very unstable area, it still is, uh, due to the great African rift that runs down 
from the northern part of Israel down through the Red Sea all the way into Africa. And the movement on that seems to have tilted. And so those Nile branches that were flowing out to the east, the water just kind of pushed and went to the other side of the delta. So it's not, some of the change is not climate related, but tectonically uh, related. Here's, here's a question that relates to Saudi Arabia. Is there any evidence that Moses and the Hebrews that he led out of Egypt may have wandered at least some of the 40 years in Saudi Arabia? Yeah, I'm a little bit doubtful of that. You have to remember that some of the traditions that come out of uh, Arabia is because of the Quran. And the Quran, like, uh, uh, wants to make it look like Moses was here too, because they believe Moses was a prophet. And of course, Abraham, according to them, was in Mecca. And that's where he almost sacrificed his son Ishmael, not Isaac. So many of the Bible stories have been recast to give it a geographical flavor that fits Arabia, because Islam was trying to say, we're really the ones that were the beneficiaries of Abraham coming to our land. Moses, and here are these traditions. So what worries me is when Christians then buy into the Islamic traditions that are trying to make the Quran look good, and they think somehow they're making the Bible look good, and I don't think, I don't think it works that way. Jim, it, it is already 8.30. I have one more, one more question for you. One of the things that we've talked about today is Egyptian, Egyptian influences on, for example, as we have expressed, uh, tabernacle, cherubim, et cetera. What about the bronze serpent, serpent story? Hmm. Well, uh, the cobra was a very important snake in Egypt. Uh, it, it was the, the cobra or the uraeus, as Egyptologists like to call it, uh, was a manifestation of the sun god's eye, the flaming eye, the uraeus. And this was, um, so we have a lot of uh, artistic representations, both two-dimensional and three-dimensional, of various cobras. Now, the description of the serpent in the wilderness seems to be vipers um, rather than cobras. Uh, so in, now I, I should say, that uh, there was a family member, the Moses family tree named Nahash, and so there is a thought that that's the word for snake, as if they were snake charmers or had this snake cult and that what Moses did is somehow connected to that. But um, certainly in Egypt and in, the, in the, the western delta, the site of Bhutto, so uh, as the crow flies, uh, from the land of Ramses, if you went 100 miles, 75 miles to the east, you'd come to Bhutto, and the, the goddess of, the patron goddess of there is, is uh, a cobra. So there were definitely snake cults and snake-related deities in Egypt. Whether that influenced the, the golden uh, serpent in the wilderness, I, I, would say, I would say probably not because God instructed this one it wasn't something that Aaron, under the pressure of the crowd, came up with, like the golden calf. So that was a good snake that became a bad snake when, in Hezekiah's day, uh, it had to be thrown out because it was becoming an object of veneration rather than remembering it as this is a reminder of what God did for us. It became the object of people's burning incense and so on. Thank you. Thank you for this conversation and for a wonderful presentation. Thank you.